I would like to start with the to welcome the audience. Thank you very much for joining us today for this very exciting seminar. I would like to start with the acknowledgement of the country. So I celebrate and acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians uh, of the land uh, on which I'm joining you from uh, today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay respects to their, their elders past and present and embrace their continued connection to this place. I'd also like to extend this respect to elders from other communities where people are joining us from today. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katrin Ovcharek. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, Katrin is the director of the Recombinant Proteins Group at CSL uh, Limited, located at Bio21 Institute. And I would like to give a bit of a background uh, about uh, Katrin. Katrin uh, gained her PhD at the John Curtin School of Medical Research in Canberra. And she completed her postdoctoral studies at the Sir Welcome Dunn School of Pathology in Oxford and Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. And then she was a senior research fellow at Monash uh, Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne. Since joining CSL, Catherine has led CSL's research group efforts in the successful development of a platform to produce mammalian derived uh, recombinant proteins that integrates target discovery, validation, lead generation and optimization through to preclinical pharmacology studies and clinical development. Catherine is involved in a range of CSL's early phase drug discovery campaigns, ensuring that a robust pipeline of new investigational drugs enter preclinical and clinical development for the prevention and or treatment uh, of human diseases. Catherine also led the discovery and preclinical research program for the novel therapeutic monoclonal antibody CSL311 uh, and continues to be involved in its clinical development as it progresses through phase one clinical trials. So I will now hand over to Catherine. Thank you again for accepting the invitation to present today. We are very excited to hear about your work. Thank you so much, Maria, for inviting me. And um, I can al already see lots of familiar faces in the audience, even though I can't actually see you. So it's, it's great that I've got the opportunity, I've been in the opportunity today to uh, tell you about what my team and the you know, research group at large has done um, at CSL. So I'll share my screen. Okay put myself in presentation mode. Yes, and the title of my talk today is Advances in Recombinant Protein Expression for Therapeutic Drug Discovery Through to Preclinical and Clinical Development. So I'm showing here um, a very nice little logo. In many, some of you may know her, Kathleen Zaglinski. She helped me design this um, for the recombinant proteins group, showing uh, obviously the, the DNA going, going through to the protein um, production. So um, to start off, I'd like to give a bit of an introduction to CSL um, and then how recombinant protein, um, you know, how we do recombinant proteins in an industry research environment. Uh, then I'll take you through the essential elements of a mammalian um, expression platform and also tell you about some of the challenges and solutions that we have. And I'll try and use specific examples, um, you know, to illustrate um, these challenges. Um, then we've been very excited because recently we've moved into a new lab at CSL. So um, I'll just give you a bit of a sneak preview um, of our new facilities and finally our acknowledgements. So hopefully there'll be a little bit of something for everybody today. Um, so CSL at a glance, I really, I just took this from the website and in fact, um, there is um, CSL operations in 35, more than 35 countries around the world. Um, we have um, uh, $9.1 billion US in annual revenue and we actually spend quite a lot uh, in R&D investments, um, 3.7 uh, billion US in the last five years. Um, through via our product pipeline. Um, interestingly, there's a, I didn't realise this, there's 27,000 plus employees around the world. And of those, um, 1,700 plus are R&D employees. We also have lots of plasma collection centres um, across China, Europe and North America. 
So uh, I'll give you some examples of CSL bearing products because not many people really know um, what CSL bearing does. Um, and certainly, you know, when you've been in the research group, you, it's easy to forget that CSL has been around for quite a few years and has many uh, products already on the market. So one of the main ones is alpha-1 proteinase inhibitor, alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, and it's also called Respreza in uh, Europe and Zemera uh, in the US. Um, we also have, and that's for treating patients um, with um, alpha-1 um, antitrypsin deficiency and clinical evidence of emphysema. There's also C1 esterase inhibitor, which is called HAGARDA, um, and that um, treats attacks from hereditary angioedema. There's products that also um, prevent acquired bleeding during trauma, childbirth, or during operations, or in the presence of anticoagulants. Uh, there's recombinant and plasma-derived um, coagulation factor concentrates, and they prevent and treat bleeding in patients with haemophilia A, B, and von Willebrand disease. And there's a big um, business with immunoglobulins. You may have heard of um, IVIG. So we have Hyzentra and Privagen, shown here on the right-hand side, and that protects um, against infections for patients with immunodeficiencies and modulates the immune system for patients with autoimmune disease. So where is CSL located? Many of you think we might just be in Melbourne, but we're not. So just within Melbourne, we have um, three main sites. We have a site uh, at Parkville near the zoo. Um, we also, and that's where Securus is also located. We have a big research site um, at Bio21 and the Nancy Millis building and the David Pennington. And there's also a CSL bearing site uh, at Broadmeadows, which is um, the plasma fractionation. But around the world, um, you'll be surprised to see that there um, are sites in, um, in the UK, um, in um, Germany, in Switzerland, and all through the US. And I think this is one of the, you know, the great things about CSL is that we're a very global company. So we have 17,000 research scientists globally. Um, and so I've been very privileged to be able to visit um, my colleagues in Bern, um, in Switzerland, and Marburg in Germany. And these sites, you know, they were originally called, they were originally plasma collection sites or plasma fractionation sites, or they were uh, making coagulation factors. That's in Germany. Um, with, whereas in the US, um, there's a big site um, just out of Chicago called, uh, in, a, in a town called Kankakee uh, that, um, that makes the um, alpha-1 antitrypsin. And, you know, you, you, can, you can go from Chicago and you drive for an hour or so, you know, and there's just this flat completely full of cornfields and then this big big factory appears and that's where they make the alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, also in the US, uh, there's a place called King of Prussia, uh, which apart from having the biggest shopping mall in the US, is really our um, head of our clinical organisation. So this makes for very interesting interactions um, and with all our colleagues. And so we, we're truly um, a global um, research and development organisation. So just to give you an idea of, of how CSL organises itself, and this is a reasonably recent um, you know, development, um, we've divided into therapeutic areas. So uh, we have across the top um, you know, immunology, um, hematology, respiratory, cardiovascular and metabolism, transplant, and also then we have the influenza vaccines. And down the bottom are the different platforms that we have. So um, there's plasma fractionation, which I told you about is, is mostly in um, broad meadows and um, you know, out, at, out at Switzerland, a recombinant technology. And recently we've started investing in cell and gene therapy. And there's also with the influenza vaccines, there's the adjuvanted vaccines and they cell based and now um, and also the old fashioned egg based vaccines. So this um, this is giving you a snapshot of what the R&D portfolio uh, looks like. And this is really, it's a bit out of date now. It's taken from the investor, um, investor briefing um, in October 2020. And you can see that we have various phases. We have research, preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three, and registration. Uh, and colour-coded are the different um, 
therapeutic areas. So in the research phase, there's lots and lots of projects. So uh, we have many discovery projects from all the um, therapeutic areas. And of those, um, and you know, of these, only a small amount move through to preclinical. So there's um, haptoglobin and subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, fibrinogen, um, CSL40, which is the novel complement inhibitor. Um, and then, and, and as they move through, um, then they go to phase one. And um, Maria mentioned um, the anti beta cobin map, CSL311, which I've been working on. Um, and my team's been working with uh, to progress this uh, since this discovery um, oh, was over 10 years ago. But certainly, we, you know, we, plus we have uh, partnered projects like anti IL 13 MAB um, and anti GCSF receptor MAB. So I think there was quite a bit of an association you know, with, with WEHI on, on some of these. And as you move through phase two, you know, things, you know, there's fewer and fewer. So we have Hyzentra, we have the anti VEGF monoclonal antibody anti-factor 12, um, moving to phase three and then to registration. Uh, so I thought I'd quickly tell you a little bit about the anti-beta common antagonist CSL311 um, because I'm going to use it as an example of how we use recombinant proteins in research um, to progress uh, molecules uh, from research through to the clinic. So in a nutshell, um, CSL311 is um, a, mo a therapeutic monoclonal antibody. It binds to what we call site 4 of the beta common receptor, and that's the beta common receptor homodimer. Um, and thereby, when you don't have CSL311, uh, this is a very simple view of what um, uh, beta common receptor signaling looks like. You have the formation of a signaling complex, that 5 phosphorylation and signaling. Um, CSL311, we were very, very lucky to find a single antibody that bound to site 2 um, on the beta common receptor and thereby blocked any interactions of um, the alpha chain with the cytokine uh, GM IL5 or IL3 with um, the receptor, thereby getting no signaling. And then in the middle, what we have, um, I've drawn as a very simple view of different types of asthma. And many of you will know uh, the beta common cytokines and how they're involved in um, myeloid differentiation, mostly for emergency um, hematopoiesis. Um, and we'll know that, in, know that an allergic eosinophilic inflammation in response to um, an allergen at GMCSF or TS and TSLP. And this recruits um, monocytes, eosinophils and basophils. And then there's also another type of eosinophilic inflammation. Um, a little bit of background. <laughs> Maybe people put themselves on mute. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so there's non-allergic eosinophilic inflammation via ILC2 cells, and you also get the monocytes, eosinophils and basophils. But interestingly, we also have neutrophilic inflammation, and GMCSF also will act via um, the fibroblasts, and um, epithelial cells, and we have recruitment of monocytes and neutrophils. So we've done a lot of preclinical studies, and we have evidence that 311 uh, will be um, an effective therapeutic agent for um, many different types of asthma. So instead of having to just treat, you know, uh, someone who has eosinophilic asthma, uh, we're hoping this will, tr will treat people with multiple phenotypes and um, thereby um, have a, because of its broad mechanism of action, have much wider efficacy than, say, something that targeted GMCSF or just IL-5. So really what we're hoping that when you don't have 311, you have the lung inflammation and the mucus production, the airway narrowing, and when with 311, um, we're hoping that this lung inflammation is um, reduced and your airways um, will um, not produce mucus and it will it will generally lead to an improvement in the quality of life and prevent exacerbations. So this is kind of a little bit of a diagram of how we would use recombinant proteins that we produce at CSL Research. And at the top, I've got a schema of how things happen in research. So you have a new product opportunity. And say in the case of um, the beta common receptor antagonist, um, you know, we had collaboration with Professor Angel Lopez in Adelaide, and we were very interested in the beta common receptors. And so these new product opportunities can be a new idea or they can be built on years and years of research by um, academics. Um, and so, but essentially, 
a small project is generated and this goes through what we call stage gate one. And then this is enters research uh, and this can be an indeterminate amount of time and we have certain criteria that we take this through. So then it becomes once once we think that this molecule, we've got a lead candidate, uh, we think this molecule has all the right attributes um, to become um, a, a therapeutic lead. Uh, we have a process called stage gate 1.1. Once it's past that hurdle, um, the next one is stage gate two. And I've shown here this thing called PD and GLP TOC. So PD is product development. And essentially, that's when you have your cell line development happening. It starts becoming a manufacturing uh, process. GLP TOX is when we take the, um, the molecule and we put it through um, animal models. In the case of the beta common receptor antagonist 311, we had a transgenic mouse because there was no cross reactivity. And it has to go through um, repeat dosing to, to look for toxic effects. It look, um, so and it, it gets chronic dosing. So, you know, we, we do quite a rigorous um, program of toxicology. Um, once that's been approved, um, it then it, it, it can go through stage gate three. And only then can it become first in human. So CSL311 has progressed um, to phase one, to first in human. And at, at each and every point, of this process, there are hurdles and challenges that you must have to overcome. Um, but what we can do in the recombinant proteins group is facilitate this by producing uh, phage display antigens. So I've shown here the beta common receptor homodimer, and you would produce that for screening your phage campaigns, um, for ELISAs, um, for uh, SPR. Um, during the phage uh, display uh, process and the affinity maturation process, you will go through multiple iterations of affinity maturation, looking at potency, till eventually you come up with your, your lead candidate, the, go the gold one here, that's, that's going to take you through uh, stage gate 1.1 to stage gate 2. So the proteins we make, you know, will be used in potent potency assays, SPR, flow cytometry. That's usually mostly in the research phase. Um, and shown down here, number six is animal studies. So once you've got your lead candidate or a surrogate for it, uh, you can be making proteins for animal studies um, all the way through, um, probably up to phase two for proof of concept um, of how your molecule works. We generate reagents for mass spectrometry and clinical assays is another very important part of our work. So we will make the reagents um, you know, for the GLP tox, uh, for the clinical studies in phase one and phase two. Um, and this can, um, you know, and, and we were able to do this because we were able to generate a large amount of protein that our colleagues in, um, in protein biochemistry purify for us. And our other colleagues um, can label um, with various um, labeling reagents. And another important thing here is structural studies. And this was very important for the CSL31 program. So I'll, I'll show a slightly better view a bit later, but you can see here the um, crystal structure of the beta common receptor showing the two uh, homodim the homodimer and the fab of CSL311. And this structure was solved by Ermi Dargat um, and in the, in the lab of Michael Parker. And this gave us really important information because it confirmed our mechanism of action. We knew that it bound exactly to site two of the beta common receptor. And it also helped us to decide what our toxicology model was. So we needed to, we knew what the epitope was. And when we compared the, say the epitope of the beta common receptor of rabbits, mice, monkeys, rats, dogs, e pigs, everything, um, the epitope didn't match. And we also had to follow that up with SPR analysis of all these. And in the end, the only alternative that we had was to use a transgenic animal where we put the human beta common receptor into these mice. And we had to present that to regulatory authorities. So recombinant proteins, you know, at the research scale, you know, are invaluable for the successful uh, progression of um, a great idea and new product opportunity and moving through from research through to phase one and phase two. So how can we make these mammalian prote these proteins? So I'm showing here um, again, um, my favorite molecule, which is the beta receptor homodimer um, and the fab of CSL311. 
and I've shown kind of the different ways that you can make these. So for this particular example, the beta common receptor homodimer was made in baculovirus and Tim Herkes would have done this, uh, Tim Herkes um, and Angel Lopez's group in Adelaide. We would have made, uh, we made the fab of CSL311 in mammalian cells and shown here is it's not very easy to see, but you can see GMCSF. And while that's not actually part of the crystal structure, um, GMCSF um, works very well um, by being made in E. coli. So there's lots of different ways that you can um, generate these proteins. But what do we do at CSL? Well, overall, we decided we made a decision to pursue a platform based on mammalian derived proteins. And the main reason is that these have quality attributes that are important for biological functions. And the reason is, is that they're secreted. And when something's secreted, it means it's correctly folded in general. We do sometimes see aggregation, but overall, when something's secreted, it means it's made it through the cells, um, processing its, its, its editing processes. And we have found that you can make high amounts pretty quickly. So with our systems, we make milligrams to gram quantities. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's still a big ask to do, you know, 10 grams for us, but uh, when we need to, and it's a good antibody, we can do that. The main important thing, and I'll tell you about this later, is the incorporation of post-translational modifications. And that's the key thing for mammalian derived proteins because these are really critical for their function. So N and O glycosylation, um, sialylation, gamma carboxylation, and how these proteins are processed. So you can have a protein that just does not work a bit uh, in vivo um, because it's inappropriately glycosylated. And I'll, and I'll show you an example of that later. Um, other things that um, make mammalian expression important is that they are able to be modified. So for example, a monoclonal antibody, um, and I'll tell you this later, how an antibody can work. It can act through just neutralization like CSL311, but it can also act through ADCC. And the way to get that to happen is to afucosylate it. Another key um, point of mammalian derived proteins is that it's much easier to have them with lower endotoxin levels because you can't um, you know, uh, do animal models with high endotoxin and having LPS in your preparations really confuses biological readouts. So um, we always um, have our proteins with very, very low endotoxin when we're doing in vivo and biological assays. So what kind of proteins do we make at research? So we make quite a lot over the years and I've had to make some weird stuff, but I'll just give you any, some examples of the types of things that we do now. So we have antibody variants and there's our standard IgGs. We have um, immunoglobulin 3s. We have bispecifics, chimerics. We have SCFEs. And I'm sure um, there's probably more out there, but um, at the moment, and um, there's Hercules, there's all sorts of different formats. So a lot of different antibody variants are made. Uh, we do FC and albumin fusions, and there's different reasons for making these. Sometimes an albumin fusion just makes your protein express much better. Um, an FC fusion, it might be useful for extending half-life, uh, or it's used as a phage display antigen. We do make cytokines, so I've shown here GMCSF and IL-3. Um, we make soluble receptor complexes. So FCRN, for example, this is what I've shown here, is actually um, a complex of um, the neonatal FC receptor, um, but also beta-2 microglobulin. So, and one doesn't, it, like the FCRN does not express without being a complex with the beta-2 microglobulin. Um, we do a lot of proteins that are proteolytically processed, and this could be really, challenging. If you're expressing it um, recombinantly, you may not have the protein um, processing enzyme that you want. And I'm going to give you a really good example of this. Um, also, we, we, we combine um, different functions of proteins. So um, while CSLs are big, um, makes a lot of plasma proteins, uh, one of my interests was looking at these plasma proteins and seeing what new things I could make um, from different plasma proteins. We've also done in the past 
lots of different viral proteins and shown here is um, the, the spike protein from SARS. Uh, and we make a huge range of receptor extracellular domains and this can be for um, SPR, for phage campaigns, um, yeah, you name it, we've, we've pretty much done them. Some of them are challenging. Some have, you know, very, very complex and we will, you know, we'll, we'll divide them down into smaller domains. But this is pretty much our bread and butter of what um, we make and what our colleagues purify for us. So I'll just give you here some of the elements of a transient gene expression system platform um, that we've set up um, at FIRE21. So there's kind of three main components. There's the gene optimization and cloning. Um, and over the years, um, we've come up with just the, the best way to do things. So we always code and optimize um, our, um, our genes and we always synthesize them. So really, I mean, you know, I used to be really excited when I could do, you know, RT-PCR and clone something out, but um, those days are long gone. And um, we like to do Gibson assembly now, which um, we use any builder, um, and it makes things nice and quick. Um, and then we have a just we have really kind of good rigorous ways of making our genes and um, and having them everything kind of standardised, so it, it works quickly and everyone pretty much follows a similar kind of way of doing things. Then the next thing, it gets a little bit more complicated. It's the transient transfection, and you can do transient transfections or stable cell lines, and um, while we do do some stables, we generally don't do that routinely because stables are very, very they're high maintenance. It takes a long time to generate them, um, very, very labour intensive. So we often will have lots of things to go through um, and we can generate lots of proning very quickly. And often the pronings we make are simply one off. So it's not worth our while to do um, these stable cell lines that comes into its own once they become a lead candidate and then they go off to um, our cell line development who are the absolute experts in this and they will move it into the manufacturing cell line so for us in research we just use a couple of workhorses at the moment uh, we used to use freestyle 293fs there's also xbchos xb293s um, xb293s that have mutations in the glycosylation pathway and that's coming in handy, I hope, for crystallography studies. And even though I did say it was going to be mammalian, I'm starting to dabble into insect cells. And that's because mostly I use, we've used liperfection, but we've just got a new toy, the Maxite. And I'm hoping that the Maxite um, will come into its own when we look at insect cells. And instead of doing the, um, making the, you know, the virus, titers and that kind of stuff, we can just directly uh, transfect using this electroporation platform. So then we also need our, our gear for growing these things. Um, another one of our toys is um, a robot. So we've got our little robot, our Andrews Alliance Plus robot, and we're going to use, we've been using that now for our small scale transfections, that's from 1 to 100 mils. And um, next is looking at them in um, and multi-well formats, which we, we've done previously, but it was a bit kind of tedious, but with the robot, uh, we'll be able to set these up um, a lot more easily. Uh, then for the medium scales, which is, you know, 250 mils to a litre, we have our Kuna stacks, which are very exciting for us to have these lovely um, state-of-the-art machines. So um, we've got a couple of those in our new lab. And the wave bioreactors, these are from Sartorius, and I used to be a real fan of wave bioreactors, and that's all I ever did, because our titers were really low. Then our titers became really high once we moved to the XB293 and XB Cho systems, so I, I ditched them, but now I've gone back to these because when you need to make a lot of protein, you can just do it in a single batch, which is good and bad because your single batch can die all at once, but overall um, it's good, and then we can do 20 litres um, in one go. So next, um, I'm just going to give you some, you know, things or, or things that we do to improve um, antibody expression levels. So as I said before, we um, we always code and optimize our our genes. But then comes the question: If I'm expressing it in XB chose, 
or which are cho which are hamster derived, or XB two nine threes, which are human. How do I code and optimize it? Do I do a cho code and optimization or a human? So that affects your choice of cell line. Then comes the expression construct. So with an antibody, um, you can have your heavy and light chains on a single plasmid, or you can have them on a separate plasmid. And what's the difference between these? So we did do a little bit of investigation into this. Now, when we first moved from um, freestyle cells, uh, which was our workhorse, we used to think we were really amazing. You know, we get, oh, wow, 50 mix per litre. Um, and this was really great. And then we moved on to um, the, the XB293s. And all of a sudden, um, we bumped our titers up to, you know, sometimes a gram per litre. And at this point, that's when I started to... Um, to lose my, I don't know, my affinity with um, wave bioreactors. I thought, well, if I don't need to do 10 litres and I can get away with one, um, I'll do that. So the change to XB293 is really marked the demise, uh, in my mind, of the wave bioreactor. Then not long after, or well, a couple of years after, um, a new cell line came out and, the, you know, we. We dabbled in Cho cells and they were just abysmal. They um, they had the, the worst titers in the world. I did them in Cho's. We'd, we'd give 40 litres of, of material to um, our poor colleagues in protein biochemistry, out of which nothing, hardly anything would come out. But this all changed once XB Cho came along. And you can see here quite, and this is in green, quite a clear difference in the titers um, that you got. Um, particularly with antibodies. And um, we've since found that XPHOs are really good for antibodies, um, maybe variable on histag pronings, but antibodies, they really, really come into their own. And this has certainly helped us um, when we need to do large amounts of proning for an animal study. Um, we, you know, it's, it's much easier to knock that over in a very short amount of time. Now, there was a question like, what do we do? We had lots of um, historic constructs. Um, some were partially optimised, so they had um, maybe the, the variable regions were code and optimised or the FC was code and optimised. Um, and then we thought, well, why don't we do an experiment? And then and then we'll know exactly, you know, what it is that we need to, how we need to optimise these. So these um, are a couple of um, antibodies, two different antibodies, and these are grown in XB Cho cells. So in pink is the partially optimised, um, blue is Cho optimised, and yellow is human. And what we've done is compare the single plasmid expression, and then we've done ratios of heavy to light. And we've done that with the two different ones. And unfortunately, I can't give you a really good answer here because you can see in this case, um, you know, the single plasmid, uh, the one-to-one -one ratio uh, of heavy to light really gives you the best conditions. Um, whereas on the other one, um, you know, we, we see slightly different. So sometimes we see that the human optimised um, is a bit better or, or the CHO optimised is better. Um, so we, we can never really get an exact um, protocol for how we optimise. In the end, what we do is we, we still do a ratio optimization when we know we want to do get a large amount. So we might, you know, just for routine ones, we'll just do the single plasmid, you know, for the quick screening. But when someone says, oh, I really need a gram of this, then we think it's worth our while. So we'll go through. Overall, we will show optimise because in general, we find that they work better in XP shows, but that's not always the case. So we we do um, we do advocate um, always checking, you know, just expressing these in both XP shows and XP two nine threes. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is how we use tran transient gene expression and combine that with post translational modification of recombinant proteins and these recombinant, I mean, these proteins, you, you can make a protein, but it doesn't always work. And the examples I want to tell you about today, bless you, um, yep. is proteins um, that are gamma carboxylated. Um, 
proteins that are glycosylated, and most proteins are, but it's really the, um, the subtleties of this glycosylation that are important, and disulfide bonds. And why would I want to talk about disulfide bonds? But I will tell you about that in a few minutes. So the vitamin K cycle. So this is why you need to eat your greens uh, is because um, coagulation factors um, require gamma carboxylation and they need vitamin K. So I've shown here on the left hand side um, what the vitamin K cycle is. Um, so we have these various enzymes, these reductases, um, uh, glutamic acid, uh, vitamin K dependent carboxylase, vitamin K epoxide, um, and this is where warfarin comes in. This is what you give rats um, when you want to kill them and they stop the clotting. So what happens with a coagulation factor? So you start off with, um, this is just an archetypical coag factor. You start off with a pre-pro protein, signal peptide gets cleaved off. Um, then you often have a pre-protein um, and then along comes an enzyme called furin. Um, and you'll end up with something that has, you know, um, an, an alpha chain, or this is called chain A or chain C. So they're, they're very, very complex. So even if you get the right processing, you will still need the post-translational modification of that polypeptide chain, um, uh, the modification of the glutamic acids by um, the vitamin K dependent carboxylase. And while um, our colleagues in Marburg, um, they have a very, very good system for generating um, recombinant coagulation factors, um, this isn't always the case in, um, in research. So what we do is we co-transfect these factors and it improves the activity of this vitamin K dependent um, factors. And we, we actually do this in freestyle cells because even though they don't produce very abundantly, um, that's what we want. So we have the coag factor here. Um, then as we progressively add in uh, what we call um, furin, um, we slowly get in more um, um, activity. And when we add in the V-core, which is the, um, the vitamin K reductase, the activity goes up. And then we add in the GGCX, which is the gamma carboxylase, the activity goes up even more. And then what we've done is we've reduced the amount of input protein of the coag factor, and we find that the levels go up even more. So in this case, having less actual milligrams of protein is better because you get it more active. The next thing I'd like to tell you about is um, making monoclonal antibodies with ADCC functions. So here we've got um, a couple of different types of um, antibody functions. So it can be a blocking active, uh, action, say like CSL311 is. So it binds its, um, the ligand or the receptor. Um, it can act as an agonist, so it can actually bind to, and this is rituximab, um, it can bind to its receptor and induce apoptosis. Uh, it can have complement dependent cytotoxicity, so it will bind, uh, the FC portion will bind C1Q and that will then lead to lysis, um, so at the B cell. Um, there's also another a type of um, it's called antibody dependent phagocytosis, um, where FC, um, the FC binds to FC gamma receptors on uh, macrophages. But what I want to tell you about today is the ADCC where the FC binds to the FC gamma receptor on natural killer cells, and then that, for, that um, uh, ends up um, lysing the cell via uh, the natural killer cell activity. And what actually happens is that the asparagine N297 of the FC is required for binding to the FC gamma receptor. And it turns out if you take the fucose off from N297, this gets up to a hundredfold increase in affinity for binding of a MAB to the FC gamma receptors, and this causes an increase in ADCC. So essentially, this is what it looks like. This is blown up here. So this is um, the only um, in glycosylation site on a monoclonal antibody, and this little red triangle is the fucose. So I'll go through this way. So what we did was we tried a couple of different methods to reduce the fucose. There's an analog called 2FF, um, which when you put it into um, the cell culture, uh, it inhibits this thing called the de novo pathway and it, um, it blocks um, the addition of the fucose onto the um, uh, polypeptide chain. There's another enzyme from uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa called RMD oxidoreductase. Um, and what this does, it deflects the diffucose de novo pathway and it leads to uh, a dead end product in mammalian cells. 
And then finally, you can add a chemical called cafunanzine, which is a mannosidase one, and it prevents the glycan cascade um, initiated through cleavage of mannose. So you end up with different pathways, but you do end up with um, glycans that do not have any fucose. And to cut a long story short, um, if you add cafunanzine, 2FF or RMD, if you look at the last one here, this is a fucose western blot. And you can see through here when, in a dose response that when you add cafunanzine, um, there's no um, fucosylation. Um, even better is the 2FF. Um, and also almost as good is the RMD oxidoreductase. And when we look at um, lysis um, in specific lysis of cells in an ADCC act, um, assay, so shown here uh, in the open um, diamonds is an untreated map. And up the top, doesn't seem to matter what method you use, but they all result in monoclonal antibodies with improved ADCC. And now what we do routinely um, is we co-transfect these antibodies with RMD because you can't get 2FF, it's a bit difficult to get it commercially, and cafunanzine is a bit com um, toxic, so RMD is really um, our method of choice. So finally, um, not finally, but quickly I'll go through sialylation. So this is... Um, another post-translational modification. And, and the, the purple things at the end are, um, are the sialyl groups. And the reason you would want to do sialylation of a protein is that you could make a protein and think it's really great. Um, however, in this example I've shown here, human CR1, um, this is um, like a, a PK analysis of CR1, just transfected into XB293s, um, but you find that it gets cleared really rapidly. However, if you add enzymes in the sialylation pathway, ST3GAL3, you find you add um, on sialyl um, uh, groups and the plasma half-life is significantly extended. And this is shown here in the mass spectrometry plot on the left. Um, when you don't have um, the co-transfection, most of the protein is ACLO. It's a little bit of monocielo. However, when you start transfecting it in, the ACLO drops, Monocielo, and it's quite a high proportion of diacielo, and this is reflected in improved half life. Oh, yes, and then finally, the hemolysis cascade. Um, so, this came out of my interest in plasma proteins, which is why I visited um, Kankakee, the, um, the site out there, because that's where they originally made haptoglobin and another molecule, hemopexin. So, the hemolysis cascade um, is my journey into these. Um, iron binding proteins, but it was also into how I came to learn to love um, disulfide bonds. And the reason is that when you have hemolysis of a red blood cell, it releases the tetrameric hemoglobin, and then eventually the tetrameric hemoglobin, it becomes dimeric hemoglobin. And this dimeric hemoglobin is actually very, very toxic. Um, but the thing that detoxifies it is a molecule called haptoglobin, uh, which is shown here. It's this kind of dumbbell shaped molecule which binds to CD163 and then um, you get heme degradation by a uh, hemoxygenase 1. If the cell free hemoglobin dissociates, then the free heme, which is extremely toxic as well, uh, but that is bound by another scavenger molecule called hemopexin that then eventually binds to LRP1. And I thought, well, how about we um, could we make a molecule that combine the function of these two? And uh, this is a little bit of a story about how we went about doing it. So how does haptoglobin work? So this is where the, um, the, the processing enzyme comes in. So we have haptoglobin, which is, a, which is a, a single polypeptide chain, gets cleared by C1RLP in the endoplasmic reticulum. Then you get disulfide bond formation and then dimerization of these haptoglobin 1 monomers. And you can see here um, the, the disulfide bonds um, between the, the two molecules. So this is what it looks like uh, recombinantly. So you do get some processing. Um, so you know, we, we, know, we knew very well what the processing enzyme was. Um, and if you don't add the processing enzyme, you see this massive amount of precursor protein. However, when you transfect it in, it all gets processed down into a beta domain and an alpha domain. So what we thought we'd initially do was just make um, a mini haptoglobin because as far as I was concerned, the alpha part uh, wasn't really um, as functional. Um, so 
however, what we found was that if we just truncated it um, right by where the beta fragment started, um, we got no expression at all. Um, similarly, I thought I'm going to destroy that disulfide bond and you find here that it still didn't work. However, when we kept it in by adding a little bit extra, um, we were able to get a small disulfide bond forming with a tiny fragment of 14 amino acids and it was like magic. Uh, we got our protein uh, produced in a very beautiful um, single peak um, coming out here. So we we're very pleased at that. And then we thought, can we use this as a scaffold for making molecules with other functions? So we, um, the one I talk about today is adding hemopexin onto um, haptoglobin. And again, we, we tried this. We went through the process of um, abutting it straight up, which didn't work. Um, taking out the disulfide bond. But again, like magic, if we added in this extra molecule, uh, 14 amino acids with the, uh, with the other, the matching um, cysteine, lo and behold, um, we got a, a beautiful molecule with shown here with haptoglobin, hemopexin up here and the beta fragment of haptoglobin. So instead of fighting the disulfide bond, by embracing it, we were able to make these multifunctional molecules. So showing here what you know, the proposed me mechanism of action would be, we'd have a small haptoglobin beta. It might be able to be concentrated due to its small size, decreased injection volume, increased penetration of tissues. Our bifunctional super scavenger um, might be able to scavenge uh, heme, uh, heme, not only heme, but also haptoglobin. And this would eventually, um, this would be smaller than it's um, the haptoglobin and potentially have use in um, indications such as intracerebral hemorrhage. So just finally, I'll just quickly whiz through our new pride and joy, um, our cell culture labs that's shown here, some are um, Essen and James and a few people I don't know, they're probably technicians looking at the Mac site, but it's all lovely and new and um, I had the pleasure of showing uh, Maria and Kay um, around that a couple of months ago. Um, so um, we've also expanded, so we have um, the, the cell culture lab, we also have a harvest lab and a very exciting, I'm showing a fridge, but it's quite, it's a nice fridge except it did squash um, one of my uh, team's fingers, but it, it's pretty good because it's right next to, um, it's in between the harvest lab and the culture lab, so everything is nice and neat and contained and it's our built-in wardrobe um, on the right hand side for hanging all the wave bags. Um, our new equipment, so we're very proud of our new Kunas. We've got the Sartorius uh, waves, um, the Maxite, and you can tell I took that photo because it's all wonky. Um, and inside our nice new hoods, we have our Andrews robot. Um, so we're hoping we went from a tiny, tiny lab in the basement, um, showing here we've got our nice big lab with the, the, the cell culture, down the bottom is the harvest, and we're hoping this will have a lot of benefits for CSL. There'll be more creativity and innovation, um, more pro uh, productivity, um, we're, we're closer to our protein biochemistry colleagues um, and we're hoping this leads to more, we call them research um, accelerated initiatives, more stage gate one and stage gate two um, progressions, more publications, patents and regulatory filings. And um, I want to thank people from the research group. There's a lot of people who are involved, but particularly from the recombinant proteins group, Matt, Natasha, Therese, James, Angela, Locke, Essen and Shweta, um, protein biochemistry, particularly Rebecca Butcher, who um, he was very clever and suggested the uh, addition of the, the disulfide bond. Colleagues in analytical, translational sciences, antibody Discovery and Prune Engineering, and I have a very good colleague in at CSL Bering and Burn, which is Thomas Gentinetta, who we worked together on the Haptoglobin Hemopexin project. And this is um, my team. So um, showing there's Shweta, Therese is on maternity leave with her little cell here, Essen, she's the photographer, James, Natasha, she's our senior molecular biologist, Angela, Locke, and Adam, um, who was in my team for a while, but he has not defective, but um, um, he's moved to protein uh, biochemistry, but he's still always part of the team, and Matt, who leads um, all the production. So I've got a, um, a video here, but I won't show it because it's too long, but you're welcome to have a look at it, and it's uh, showcasing um, our lab. So I think I'll finish there and, um, yeah, take some questions. Thank oh, you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful presentation. 
And I want to thank you also for your uh, your assistance with setting up a protein production facility. It was absolutely invaluable and for giving us a lovely tour and insight into your workflows. Uh, it was really amazing. Thank you. Um, so now uh, questions. Uh, I don't see any in the chat or anyone. You can raise your hands up if you have questions for oh, that there is a uh, question and I'll read it for you. So um, we have a question. Thank you for a great talk. Very cool stuff. I have no experience with mammalian expression, but 100 to 1000 mix, mix per liter is huge yield. I think that it was, yeah, uh, it's a huge yield comparing to what we usually get from bacteria or insect cells. Do mammalian cells generally express so much better or are antibodies usually much better expressed? Do you have any other tricks to boost yield? Yeah, that's a really good point. And in general, um, we do get our best yields from uh, antibodies, um, but we also get very good yields from albumin uh, proteins, fusion proteins, but we do have some real disasters, some hardly express at all. So and we, we do have lots of tricks to improve them. So we, we have the same platform. Um, you know, with the XB293s, um, we add little extra goodies to the cells uh, to make them happier. So we, we have this thing called loop, Katrina Lupin that we always add and that bumps it up a bit more. Um, when something doesn't express so well, we might go into XB Chos. Um, but, but in general, we do get very, very good yields. Um, but sometimes, you know, yield isn't everything. So you might have a lot of protein that's inactive or it's, you know, it's, it's, it's aggregated. So um, overall, the expression levels are much higher than uh, bacterial cells. And I'll add question to that because you're you're speaking you showed us the comparison between freestyle two nine three and XP Cho and XP two nine three. I mean it seems like these systems are really fantastic. I believe that a lot of uh, uh, scientists still go for the um, I, I would call it old style uh, PEI system, you know, and then there there will be costs related. So what is your experience in terms of like cost? Is it worth going through through your you know examples? It seems like it's really worth spending money on these expression systems because you would end up actually economically in much better situation if you yeah, get that's a, that's a really good point and i think you know we often get asked to quantify how much does it cost for one liter of expression and it's the same cost if you get a gram per liter as if you get a mic per liter so you know, overall, I think you're a winner if you um, use one of these systems because, you know, you're, you're getting this, this gram per litre, which you generally don't get with PEI. Um, then you also, with PEI, you'd have to have very, very high um, volumes. And um, we don't like to give these volumes, large volumes, to our purification colleagues. Um, because they'll think something's wrong if we if we give too much. So it's it's bad for you know EHS, you know manual handling, all this kind of thing. You know we wouldn't have enough room. When we think that we think our fridge is really enormous, we just wouldn't have enough room for large volumes. So I think it depends on the scale. So if you're doing small amounts, then PEI is fine. But when you're and that's what people come and collaborate with us because they need hundreds of milligrams and they know we can we can deliver this for them. So I think it just depends on your situation. Hi, I think I saw a few questions. Yes, I can read. So next one is from Kay. Thank you, Caddy, for a fabulous talk. What systems do you use to generate proteins that are normally expressed intracellularly? Well, that is a always been a um, not a thorn in my side, but a, a challenge. So um, you know, some proteins, you know, I, I end up uh, admitting defeat and having to go to um, E. coli. Um, but sometimes, you know, I'm, you know, pleasantly surprised. So we can look, uh, we might be generating a protein that's, you know, an antigen for an autoimmune um, um, protein that, you know, will, will get sort of um, secreted. Um, and we might look for, um, you know, chaperones. So we'll trawl the literature, um, you know, um, and we have a very good recent example. I mean, Adam was was helping, you know, out with this one, um, you know, and there's other ones where we might have to go to bacteria, um, but we find that we need to add a lot of DTT uh, to keep it in the right form. 
trouble is you can't stick DTT in your animal at the at the levels. So then what do we do? Then we might go to bacular virus. So it is a very tough thing to do. Sometimes they just express for no good reason. Um, but in general, it is a, it is quite a challenge for us to do these intracellular proteins. All right, uh, I'll have a, a next question. Hi, Catherine, great talk. Do you add signal uh, sequence in your constructs for proteins you like to be secreted? Um, yes, so we do. Um, so we just use um, for antibodies, just use a standard antibody uh, signal peptide or whatever comes from it. But for our other proteins, we, we have our favourite signal peptides, uh, which we worked out over the years. You know, first we, we look at the endogenous signal peptide, put it through signal P. If it looks a bit rubbish, we might stick another one on there. Um, and we, we, as I said, we've got our favourites that we know are going to cleave really nicely and give us higher expression levels because that's really, you know, what it comes down to, what comes out of the cell um, quickly enough. So, yeah, um, we, we do a little bit of playing around, but we do have our, our, our favourites. Another question from uh, BH, from the guest. Thanks for the great talk. Do you think introducing mutations in FC region to enhance a DCC would be easier than controlling the aficosylation of antibodies? Um, yes, and there is technology out there. Um, oh, I can't remember what it was, Zencore. So there, there's a lot of companies that do that. And the reason I do it in research is just a, a quick way of doing it. You know, you can just quickly evaluate whether if you just co-translate this and you know it's aficosylated, you compare if you cosylated and aficosylated and um, know that you're going to get improved um, ADCC. And then you can choose to go down. Uh, if you ever wanted to make this into a product, then you would go down it, um, the, the, the route of engaging with um, a company um, and, and license their technology. And then there's you know, plenty of antibodies out there. There's Benralizumab um, that's... Um, you know, once it's an ADC um, mediated one, and they have a, a specific aficosylation um, platform. But Zencore, you're right, just has the mutations. But I reckon just chucking some RMD in is a, is a pretty quick way of evaluating that. And we have a couple more. I'll go very quickly. Uh, so if I got it correctly, you mentioned that antibodies are secreted. Do you purify them from TC media then, or do you still lyse the cells? So oh, no, no, they're, they're, they're very um, depending. Yeah, they're, they're all secreted. So everything we do is secreted. So, yeah. But, and but no license. <laughs> and there was one more about glycosylation. Yeah, a couple of questions more. Uh, so, yeah, the, thanks for the talk. Have you observed the difference in glycosylation between proteins from XP293 and XP Cho cells? Yes, and I, we do actually, but that's spot on. We, we do see a, see a big difference, and I thought I'd be able to solve um, the problem with XB chos because they really undercellulate, even worse um, than the XB293s, and I thought, oh, I'll just do my trick of transfecting in um, ST3GAL3 and ST3GAL6, um, but it didn't work. <laughs> so there's something else missing. So which I haven't worked out yet. So, um, and it could be the media, something in the media is not quite right. So I don't know if it's a defect in the Cho cells themselves. So we're gonna start investigating that with the Max site and playing around with, you know, because in the XB Cho, there's HDAC inhibitors, which does all sorts of stuff. So yeah, there's, that, there's a definite difference. Uh, excellent, and we ran out of time. So I just want to thank you, Cathy. If you were on site, you will get a great round of applause. Yes. It was a fantastic talk. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for inviting me and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.